Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Innovation in the Round. I know this is the first day of the Startup Week Hartford, and we hope that you've enjoyed all of the content brought to you thus far. We have a great conversation lined up today, and with that, I would like to introduce the panelists we have collected on this screen. We have Stacy Brown from InsureTech Hartford, Michelle Cody from Launch Hartford, we have Greg Flynn from Upward, Susan Winkler from CTIFS, and I am Laura with NASA Reimagine. So with that, I'm gonna actually give the floor to each of our panelists for about a minute and a half to talk to you a little bit about who they are and what role they play within Hartford's and SureTech ecosystem. So let's start out. Stacy, introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Laura. Hi, I'm Stacy Brown. Uh, about four years ago, I launched an organization called InsureTech Hartford. And uh, what we do is we help bring people together within the community that helps strengthen the connectivity of the community. And we also help the startups uh, to gain exposure both locally here in Hartford as well as through our global network. Wonderful, Michelle. Hi, thanks, Laura. Uh, my name is Michelle Cody. I lead uh, Launch Hartford, which is an initiative to make Hartford, Connecticut, the best city on the East Coast of the United States to launch or grow a business. Um, I've been working with our insurance community here in Hartford for about three and a half years. Uh, lucky enough to be able to get support from Aetna, Cigna, the Hartford and Travelers and launching um, Hartford's uh, InsureTech Hub which included uh, three years of an accelerator and uh, we're on the cusp of being able to announce the next big program that's uh, coming down the pike. And uh, really just proud of our community's ability to welcome in the best technology companies from all over the world to learn about how to disrupt and disrupt and advance um, uh, the US insurance sector. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Greg. All right, great. Thanks so much, Laura. So hi, everyone. My name is Greg Flynn. I am the program director over at Upward Labs. Um, and Upward Labs is a venture fund and accelerator program here in Hartford, focused on two areas, um, property technology and then aged care technology. Um, wanted to spend actually a minute too to talk about Upward as a company and sort of the assets we have as Upward as a company. Um, and so Upward is dedicated towards the revitalization of cities. That's the purpose and the mission of the company. Um, and what that means from a practical perspective is we create spaces and environments which um, help drive and help foster innovation. Um, so one space we have in Hartford is um, what's called Upward Hartford. It's a 30,000 square foot co-working space and event space, um, you know, kind of an innovation destination in Hartford. Um, we also have one of um, the state of Connecticut's first co-living spaces, which we just opened up a few months ago, um, right located right in downtown Hartford, which is a living space for technologists, for entrepreneurs, and for corporate innovators. Um, and then the third asset we have as part of Upward is Upward Labs, which I just mentioned is our venture fund and accelerator program. So nice to meet all of you and looking forward to a great discussion. Great. Thanks, Greg. Susan? Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Winkler. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Insurance and Financial Services. We are an initiative of the Metro Hartford Alliance, but our jurisdiction is really the Connecticut Insurance and Financial Services cluster. What that means is that uh, I, re I uh, report to a board of directors of 32 uh, large insurer and global financial insurer brands. Uh, we work together to strengthen and, and advance the industry in Connecticut. What we do is we work on workforce development, uh, whether that's creating new pipelines or relationships with our academic partners or high schools in order to encourage careers into IFS in Connecticut. We work with our partners here on insure tech as a growing industry. Captive insurance is another economic driver for the state of Connecticut. And we act as public advocates. We gather a lot of data to be sure that our partners know the value, the economic output, and why we are such a, a large and one of the more important economic industries for the state of Connecticut. Happy to work with all the companies that are coming in, large or small, startups here today and technology and startups and entrepreneur companies to encourage them to come to Connecticut and Hartford uh, to start their business. That's great, thanks so much. And you know, we've heard a lot about Hartford, obviously Startup Week Hartford, it's very important. I think it makes sense to talk about Hartford. So earlier in, in the day, Michelle had a chance to uh, engage in conversation and talked a little bit about what Hartford has for assets and the value that we bring to the table within New England and for the entire country for that matter. But I'd like to get some more perspective around why Hartford. So Susan, I guess to start with you, insurance capital of the world. 
Can you talk to us a little bit about how we've earned that title and what it means? You know, thanks for asking that, Laura. I've always take a show of hands, you know, who thinks we still are the insurance capital? We have not, thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we haven't lost the title. There, there's a lot of people that doubt that we are still the insurance capital, but we are. What does that mean? So I'm not gonna go through the litany of data that I have to, to substantiate that. But we do have the highest concentration of employment per capita in our small state. So here we are, we still have the highest concentration through any of the US, US states. Uh, we are in fact, the insurance capital. We have the highest concentration of actuaries. You'd like to use that as a number one ranking too. And of course we, we write the, the highest uh, written premium here for health, uh, direct health premium here in, in Connecticut. So we have a small state, but it's a powerhouse. And with that, the types of in, uh, employees are really what matters. Uh, high, highly skilled workforce here that cannot be really compared anywhere else uh, in the U.S. from risk managers, auditors, underwriters, uh, financial managers, analysts, data scientists, etc. Um, they're here and we're continuing to cultivate and build that force of labor here in Connecticut and Hartford region. Absolutely. So now we, we understand the labor element of it. Stacey, if you could talk a little bit about the work that InsureTech Hartford does and engaging this community and keeping the content in the in the connections relevant and, and happening. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as Susan said, there's a lot of talent here. And so uh, that means there's a lot of people uh, with a lot of skills, but everybody sits in their corporate towers, you know, let's say going back four years ago before we started uh, this focus on insure tech in our community. Um, people came into Hartford, they sat in their towers, maybe they went out for lunch and then they went home. So there wasn't a lot of interaction happening. And so we started having uh, events, uh, networking events, uh, which was effective in terms of getting people uh, to come and to meet. And then magic things started happening. And that, that led us to then looking at other opportunities like hackathons. And uh, you know those early days of networking events and hackathons have grown up to the point where now um, in SureTech Hartford, helps um, uh, run, uh, we run a conference every year now. We, uh, we, we recently this year kicked off our first uh, uh, glo global innovation challenge. So everything that we've been able to do and grow in Hartford has up and allowed us to connect Hartford to this larger, more global ecosystem, um, but still goes back to those basic elements of, you know, innovation happens when, when you take diverse, uh, people of diverse backgrounds and skills and you mash them together and you, and you get them collaborating on stuff. And so that's been, a, I, I believe, a big part of the driver uh, to growth in, in our ecosystem. Absolutely. And now that we have everyone out of the towers, you know, pre-COVID, obviously right now we're all out of our towers. We're in our kitchens <laughs> or our living rooms and other living facilities. Although Greg is at Upward. Um, kind of, Greg, put it the question to you in, in terms of now that everyone's used to getting out of the towers and onto the streets of Hartford, can you talk a little bit about what goes on over at Upward and not only just the accelerator program, because that's, that's absolutely amazing, but how you're working on bringing people to the streets. Um, and, and a lot of what you're doing is, is very innovative. It hasn't been seen before. So now from Susan's perspective, here we are, we're amazing. Stacy's gotten us together for some content and you've gotten us out of our global towers. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so I, I think I'll say a couple of things in and around Upward. It's, it's the, um, you know, the best way to phrase it would be, you know, we, we take the idea and the approach of how can we make life, um, you know, how can we, how can we make a, a significant improvement on the life of an entrepreneur? Um, and what are the assets that we would need to provide that entrepreneur in order to really create a compelling environment for them? You know, so if you're an entrepreneur, what you're going to need is you're going to need a network, you're going to need a community, you know, you're going to need a place to work where you're in and around like-minded people. Um, but we've even over at Upward, we've taken that a few steps further and we've said, look, you, you want that basically over at work, but you also need that basically over for your living space as well. Um, and so one of the things, you know, Laura, that you know that we put into place is our co-living space over at 196 Trumbull Street. Um, which is, you know, 32 basically spaces for co-living, which we hope to basically fill the whole space with technologists and 
And if you think about it as a technologist, how amazing would that be? I mean, look, going through a startup is a really, really difficult journey. There's a lot of there's a lot of skill sets that you need, and sometimes it can be like lonely. But how unbelievable would it be to basically live with a group and live with a community of people um, who are all going through the same journey at once, where you can share lessons and share stories together and really kind of have that community. Um, so I just think that's such an um, such a valuable asset. And so these are the types of things that we're basically trying to contribute to the community. Um, you know, our, our mantra over at Upward is, to, um, is work is live and thrive. So work is our co-working space, live is our co-living space, and thrive is the accelerator programs that we've taken on. Um, so we're trying to address it kind of holistically. You know, I think kind of having startups come into a city and not know anyone, obviously we know is, um, is gonna be sort of a recipe for not working. And we're try to, trying to provide some of these foundational asset, assets, which are really the type of assets which can foster innovation in and around Hartford. Great. And, and Michelle, now that we have all the pieces laid out onto our chessboard here, can you talk a little bit about how launch brings us together as a collective ecosystem to move forward as Hartford? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we have this community that's chock full of people who are taking the lead on doing new things and figuring out um, uh, where opportunities exist, where gaps exist, and uh, filling them, right? So uh, at launch, what we try to do really is just act as a convener, uh, a connector, and a champion of all of that activity um, and, and find ways to uh, bring together different groups of innovators from across uh, the ecosystem and then celebrate all of the amazing work that's happening. So we try to promote the things that are happening at NASA Reimagine, um, promote things that are going on um, through InsureTech Hartford, Upward Hartford, CTIFS. Um, it's really our goal to be the one place that uh, folks can come um, with uh, our newly enhanced website and kind of get a 360-foot uh, kind of picture of what's happening in the city um, uh, and discover all of the really cool things that are being led by uh, all the individuals in, in our community, the corporations who are uh, supporting that activity and driving that activity um, and find their place uh, to become a part of it. So um, it's it's been an incredible, incredible uh, journey over the last four years to see this come to life uh, and to see it bloom. And I can't wait for what's next. That's great. So on the theme of what's next and looking ahead, obviously the pandemic has affected all of us in countless ways, professionally, personally, globally, et cetera. But, but looking into the tech piece of it, you know, I, I'd like to throw the question out on the table of whether or not you think the pandemic has created more of an opportunity for tech and tech solutions. So I'll let whomever wants to jump at that one first, because um, I know that we're all going to have some thoughts around that one. Yeah, so I can I can jump in a little bit, um, and then I'll I'll pass to Susan because I know that you you've got some stuff that you want to say on this topic. Um, but you know, in talking with uh, our insurance carriers that have really been leading a lot of the um, uh, activity in terms of attracting new companies to our city, right? Um, they've been kind of quick to point out that this particular set of circumstances um, uh, has has brought some new stuff to the table in terms of things to be thinking about, but what it really has done is just accelerated trends that we saw coming, um, uh, you know, maybe two, five, 10 years down the road and uh, created a need now for those same things, right? Um, so figuring out how to uh, capture data about the world um, in real time rather than relying on historical facts uh, to guide our decision-making processes, right? Uh, figuring out how to connect with people wherever they may be and in whichever channel may be open to them, right? If they're not um, uh, at their offices, if they're not um, in their homes, if they're on the go, how do you engage with um, a, a group of people that uh, want to know what's happening and if they're covered uh, for certain circumstances that they may be dealing with in life? Uh, how do you predict uh, the challenges that people might want coverage to be able to help them uh, work their way through? I mean, I think that, that you know, people really can't, couldn't have predicted in, um, uh, in, in uh, months prior, right, how particularly uh, different businesses might be affected by the fact that we're not working face-to-face, -face, how livelihoods may change, how um, behavior 
behavior may change and how does the industry flex with that to provide um, the reassurance uh, and the protection to be able to um, maintain our lifestyles that I think the insurance industry was was really founded upon right so um, you know I've seen I've seen that happen um, and I've seen all of our our insurance companies and our insurance co uh, carrier leaders work very very quickly behind the scenes to figure that out over the last couple of months and that's been inspiring for me to to watch um, at least Susan no I, I'm gonna agree with you because acceleration without with notwithstanding COVID has pushed everything from a what was a three to five year plan to six months and beyond and there's still a lot of uncertainty so what I think that allows is some ability to um, to still think ahead and not know so everybody is walking cautiously because all of us really don't know what the next six months or a year is going to bring. We think we know, and we're all walking cautiously, at least for the next six months. I think there's some degree of certainty of what may happen. And I think the insurers are willing to work towards that. But I will say, and one thing I'd like to talk about in here in the insurance capital, how nimble, and I'd like the panel to, to, to weigh in too, you know, how nimble and agile the insurers were in order to take and accelerate things so quickly. Um, there's, you know, everyone looks at the insurance industry as stoic and, you know, slow moving and, and stationary, but I can attest, and I'd like to hear the, the panelists, just, panelists to say, that's not the case. Um, and it was really quick, it was fast. Everybody virtually work at home, new opportunities, new business models, throw some things right out the window get ready for new. And um, I'd like to get the panelists uh, um, weigh in on that because that's what I've seen, just the newness of the insurance industry willing to tackle it and go forward. So I could take a shot at that. Um, Stacy Brown here. So I, I actually have two hats, right? So with my other hat, I'm actually an insurance technology executive for a global carrier. So I see both sides of the, of, of the fence. And um, you know, one thing that has um, uh, become very apparent through all this, um, and Susan, yes, and, and, and Michelle, you know, we've been able to, uh, you know, get digital real fast in terms of leveraging tools like Zoom and, and or Microsoft Teams and, and, and better ways of communicating and to collaborate. But, um, but still a lot of the business challenges, there's a lot of business challenges that weren't really as obvious in the past as they are in a in a virtual environment that post covid has created for us so uh, for an example you know there are there are documents uh, that some you know regulators require to be you know signed and sealed with a raised seal in order to be you know filed or to be considered um, some contracts that need to be you know have wet signatures to be considered legally binding so that's a process a business process that when you suddenly wake up and you're in a virtual environment now you got to worry about these documents getting fedexed all over the world and then people signing them and then they're not showing up on time and it just becomes a very painful process so people rapidly start thinking about digitization of the process uh, more so than they did in the past. And I, and I think also things like that are now causing people um, to, to realize that, hey, you know what? Yeah, there's been all this buzz about digital transformation, but I guess it's, it now is the time to do something. So it has created a bit of a incentive um, to, you know, for, for insurance carriers to move forward. But there's a whole other uh, side of the spectrum that as we move forward, it's not just moving forward uh, based on the world that we've come from, right? There are new sources of data and information, for example, IoT, right? So the, the, the future of, of insurance is gonna be a lot more dependent on IoT solutions and, and IoT-based data than in the past. And uh, you know, blockchain has been very slow to, to take up in the industry, but it also has its its future if we're we just got to be patient still at this point but th hopefully those are some real concrete examples that i can give about how you know covid 19 is causing changes in the way insurers are operating and how they're thinking and how they're looking at the future absolutely that's great stacy 
Um, Greg, curious, so staying on the technology track and the exposure that you have to all sorts of startups from around the world, are there certain kinds of technologies that are being used in response to the pandemic? Or are you seeing trends um, come up where, where companies have had to pivot or change based on this? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, the you know simple way that I like to phrase it is what, what I've seen for COVID for my startups and for the companies in my program is that there's you know, there's a very clear line and you're on the right side of the line or you're on the wrong side of the line. And it's, it, it, um, it tends to be very binary from that perspective. So, you know, over at Upward Labs, we have a number of companies who have just technologies for, um, you know, properties, right? So technologies for, that help building owners understand the occupancy counts of their buildings, that um, helps um, the environmental um, conditions of those buildings. So we've had um, a number of companies in our program which have air quality solutions. Um, indoor air quality solutions, people who um, even have the type of um, solutions which um, can screen out and can purify and can filter the coronavirus out of the air. Um, and all of those companies, you know, I guess sort of self-evidently are on the right side of the line and are literally just going gangbusters right now. Um, we have other companies over on the other side of our lab, um, which are focused more on health for senior citizens. Um, and those technologies, which are particularly focused on social isolation. Um, so you have many seniors who are in communities, for example, assisted living communities and rehab communities that literally can't visit their loved ones. They can't visit their, or can't have visitors for families and friends. Um, and those companies are also basically doing extremely well because that's basically an active need. Um, and then we have some companies that are basically on the flip side, which don't meet those criteria or have solutions which are less relevant in, in the COVID world. So, I mean, certainly what we've seen is that the world has basically bifurcated and depending on what side of the line you're, either, you're going to have a significant amount of momentum and a significant amount of traction, or you're going to need to find other opportunities or other business opportunities or pivot in order to sustain your momentum. You know, Laura, another example I could bring in here to the to the group and for the audience is that captive insurance is another opportunity uh, where COVID is, has accelerated that alternative risk vehicle and the opportunity to look at that is, okay, now what is the landscape of my business now? Where are the risks? Where are the new risks that I have to manage? And maybe is there is captive insurance, which I won't get into too much detail, but I stand ready to answer any questions on that. Um, directly from anybody interested, um, that becomes now, it, it is now brought up more as a prioritization as maybe an alternative risk vehicle for, for companies. So that's a true and tangible example as well of things and how things have shifted with COVID and what becomes maybe more of an opportunity for companies. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, there's internal strategic priorities that are different for every company, depending on the line of business they're in, uh, carrier specifically, et cetera. But I'm, I'm kind of curious. So we talk a lot about the technologies and we gave specific examples from, from Greg's piece there, which, you know, thank you for that, Greg. Curious in terms of what are people hearing or seeing from a funding standpoint? So the world stopped spinning for a brief amount of time while part of it was spinning out of control. And there's a piece as a startup where money is important. Sometimes uh, money is a great thing. Sometimes money gets a little tricky, but funding in general, have, have you seen, um, and again, open to the group here, whether or not there's a strategic priority from a corporate perspective in terms of are insurance companies um, investing in some of these insure techs? Do you think now in general, yes, faster because of what's going on and their need to pivot or has, has the focus kind of changed slightly on that? So I guess, Stacy, to you, um, since you wear two hats from both a startup angle and a corporate angle, how have you seen funding change since the start of COVID? Well, when the freeze, uh, if you wanna call it that, uh, first you know, kicked in, um, I think what we saw, and this wasn't just specific to the insurance industry, um, you know, a lot of big corporates started pulling back on projects, right? They started looking at things and they projects fell into really one of three um, categories. Either it was, you know, keep going. Um, the, the other category would be um, put it on hold. And then the last category would be shut it down altogether. So, um, you know, typically how far a project was in terms of, you know, completion and the benefit it was creating was, was a big driver to that. Because, and the big 
reason for that was because nobody really knew how long and how deep um, this was going to go. So that people just became very cautious. Um, and when that happened, I think startups took the biggest hit, to be honest with you. I think because uh, a lot of the, the dollars that goes into programs and projects that startups are engaged in, um, a lot of that is uh, discretionary type of projects, right? So um, I think when when things were getting put on hold and or, and not and so new projects not starting or projects just getting canceled altogether, I think startups took a took a big whack from that. But now you know going forward, I think um, carriers and I think it varies from carrier to carrier, but they're they're looking at it again and they're saying, okay, how do we how do we proceed now? And uh, earlier in the earlier days of InsureTech, I think what we saw was a lot of funding and spend that went into, I'll call it experimentation, right? Where it was about test and learn, try and see. Um, but, but now I think insurers are gonna continue to wanna innovate with startups, but the, the, they're gonna be trying to be more use case applicable and uh, make sure that they have good valid business purposes and reasons for those things. So in other words, they just have to be smarter about the, the investments that they make. Absolutely. Would any of the other panelists like to react to that question around funding as well? Yeah, I mean, it's just to build on Stacey's point, I think that he's he's right on, particularly with the 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 ending part of the statement around specificity, right? So, um, uh, starting with a um, a use case, a problem statement, an opportunity specific in mind, and then going out to source a solution that can actually um, uh, serve that goal is something that that we're seeing um, a, a preference to. There's also um, starting to be a preference for a little bit more um, later stage companies. So again, uh, things that are ready to be deployed, um, have working technology um, and can get into the market immediately rather than um, early stage ideas. So more pressure for those early companies, right? Um, to use a resource Resources wisely demonstrate that they have specific capabilities, build those capabilities before they get to uh, the interaction phase with the insurers and then um, be able to hit the ground running faster. So we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of that. Um, I think it's going to be incumbent on other types of funders to help those earlier stage companies get through um, uh, to, to that point of maturity. And so I think for um, you know, the, the companies just starting out being very wise about how to source resources, use resources, and really play the long game um, before, uh, before approaching um, a carrier with uh, a potential solution is, is probably the, the right way to go. Laura, I also want to mention just overall, uh, we conducted a survey of the CTIFS executive board back in July, and 77% said they will maintain, they will, the insure tech will be maintained as a strategic priority. 70% plus said that they would continue to fund insure tech efforts. So those are strong numbers to substantiate you, Michelle and, and Stacy, um, on your comments. Um, just letting you know that, that that is a, those are hard numbers in a, in a real survey in, in July. Great, it's, it's happy to hear. So I guess, um, you know, Michelle made a point that's interesting to me and, you know, a lot of the focus from the carrier perspective may be on the, the startups or the scale-ups that are farther along in their process or their journey. But Greg, you have the opportunity to, to work with and get to know a lot of companies at various stages. Do you have any um, suggestions or recommendations on how some of the earlier stage companies could potentially uh, vie for attention in a positive way where they're not simply just sending an email to an inbox saying, look at me, here's what I can do, but really kind of boots on the ground, maybe a tip or two for this, for the startups um, to really get the attention of a carrier at this hard time. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great, great question. And I mean, the first thing that I would say on that, Laura, is that, um, you know, when you're dealing with an insurance company, to some extent, I really do think that it's important to from a company perspective, you need to be ready for prime time. Um, you know, you, there needs to be a working product. There needs to be a prototype. There needs to be some teeth in and around what you have, or else you're going to go to the insurance carriers. You're going to go to the companies, and it's it's the the whole solution and the whole package is not going to be up to snuff, right? So the first thing that I like to tell people is you need to make sure that you're basically ready for prime time and you're ready to engage. Um, and and I think that's just really critical. 
Um, the other thing is that you have to bring, you have to bring something new, you have to bring something different and you have to bring something unique and you have to bring that to the table. If what you're doing is very similar to what everyone else is doing, um, you know, you're basically just gonna get lost and you're gonna get drowned out in the crowd, right? So it needs to be some unique angle that you're bringing in order to get people interested in the solution. Um, and then the last thing I would say, the third thing is basically the bigger the problem, the better. Um, you know, I mean, you can, you can sort of toy around with a small problem or sort of an ancillary problem, but if you're, you know, if you're addressing something that's different, if it's unique and it's a big problem, then those are the types of things that are at least going to get someone's ears perk up, uh, to get their ears to perk up a little bit when you're having a conversation with them. So, I mean, those are basically the three things I, I would say to that. So to, to play a little bit deeper into that piece of it, because I think we, we have a good majority of our audience today who are on the earlier stages of their company. I guess, um, and I'll ask the question to the, to the three remaining panelists, starting with you, Stacey, what is something that you could recommend or that you've seen for a startup people to stand out, to really get some a corporate's ears to perk up, to use Greg's wording? Hmm. Um, I don't think it's a what as much as it is a how, and I, and, and, there is so much information. So I literally uh, spend the first five minutes of my day every day, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, but it's, it's sitting there going through my inbox going delete, 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 delete. I've started to set up rules so it's getting better, but <laughs> there is just so much spam out there. Chances are some, something that comes into me that way, I'm not even going to read it because I, 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 my, my, my email tells me that it's an external email and it's not somebody I know, I'm not even reading the email. So I think that's like the most ineffective way to try and gain eyeballs uh, from, from a carrier. In fact, some people find it annoying, if not rude. Um, so, so then the question is, how do you? Uh, so warm relationships help a ton. And go back to, you know, with InsureTech Hartford, why we do what we do is to help enable that by engaging in uh, community events or um, community problem solving things like hackathons and, uh, or, you know, even some of the stuff that uh, NASA Reimagine has been doing in terms of running workshops, uh, thematic workshops and stuff um, that that's been very helpful for the community as well, even like you guys had one not too long ago, where you brought in a bunch of investors right so it's just through, I think. You, the thing is, you can't do those things every day. So sometimes you might feel like, hey, I got to do something today. Just um, try to try to plug into communities um, and, and try to build relationships a bit of the old fashioned way, as opposed to, you know, direct marketing and emailing, thinking you're going to capture somebody's eye because chances are uh, you're just going to turn them off. And that includes random LinkedIn pings as well. <laughs> Absolutely. We can all relate to that, I'm sure. Michelle, how about your take on this? Um, I think particularly for early stage companies, um, I would just urge uh, folks to learn as much about the industry as humanly possible. I think that, you know, a lot of times, um, especially technology um, founders, right? They get inspired by an issue that they have um, with insurance coverage or an issue that they observe about insurance coverage and think to themselves, it's crazy that nobody has done X, Y, Z, or it's crazy that something is organized like it is, right? Um, and what I have learned uh, over the last couple of years is that more often than not, there's a very good reason um, that things are organized the way that they are. It may not be understandable to, to most of us from where we sit now, but um, uh, there are lots of um, really complex regulations, particularly in the United States, about how insurance coverage can be offered um, and how it can be sold and distributed uh, that are rooted in consumer protections. And a lot of the reasons um, that things are slow is because um, uh, people have, have decided that the slow way is the safe way um, to deploy this type of coverage. So um, uh, the biggest mistake that I I see, long story short, is that uh, people who are really, really excited, eager um, uh, uh, technologists kind of come in barreling into these meetings with the insurance industry and say, we can do this, 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 and this, um, and completely overlook uh, the, the base foundation of why none of that has already been tried before. Um, so I would say lead with questions, um, get to a, a, a very friendly um, uh, person who actually has lived 
lived inside of an insurance company and um, start with questions, not answers or suggestions um, and really try to unpack why things are done the way that they're done. And then armed with that knowledge, think about what can be done within uh, the constraints of regulation, distribution, process, um, uh, and figure out a, a creative way to innovate rather than kind of um, leading with criticism uh, or uh, what people think uh, oftentimes can be a magic wand in a scenario that uh, is often more complex than it, it seems uh, on its face. Absolutely, and, and Susan, your take. I, you know, I'll just add to that. The one last thing I would say is make sure you know the customer of the insurer is changing and they are trying very hard to make sure they understand the customer preferences, the customer's risks and restrictions if it's healthcare. And, you know, Greg was mentioning some solutions for, for those that are, are sequestered or having difficulty, um, maybe telehealth or what are you doing now uh, for your, everything has changed. I'm not sure what's going to go back. Like that's the uncertain thing. So all of us, all of our preferences have changed, right? And from work at home to cybersecurity to the way that we demand consumer preferences and likes, um, our risks are, have changed. So the insurers right now are trying to get very much ahead of their customers because that is their priority. And what is the customer's need? What are they now? How have they shifted? And will they continue to shift? We don't know, but they have shifted. Um, so I think that the one thing that I can give as advice is make sure your solution is attached to the customer's needs and preferences that are of today and tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that in our space, we see a lot of, you know, majority of things going digital. As Stacey had mentioned, some things are still raised seal, wet ink on paper, and we're working through that as well. But as an industry with heavily, heavily regulated, um, that takes time. And there's an old joke about moving at the speed of insurance. I think that will continue to move at the speed of insurance as everything else is sped up around us. But kind of digging a little bit deeper um, in, in, you know, this question from the audience in terms of how have or how do insurance companies change to meet the consumers where they are today. So I guess looking at a digital perspective of insurance, because insurance in some people's minds may be a little antiquated, maybe a little slow, um, and in comes to play insure tech. So I guess Stacy, starting with you, what are some of the what are some of the differences in terms of how the business is being handled today, not even just in response to the pandemic, but but as the, the industry continues to evolve? Well I think you know we've seen the the demographic shift in the work in the in in the workforce right so what does that mean so somewhere we've finally reached this clipping point where there are more millennials in the business workforce than there are uh, um, baby boomers right so right there there's just been a, a seismic shift in terms of uh, the profile of of, of the average person that you're doing business with, um, the average consumer as well. And, um, and so when you look at, you know, in the old days, I'll call it, right? Um, you know, when you need, when you had insurance needs, you went down to the local insurance agent during his or her, whatever their office was, uh, business hours. And you, uh, you might have had to call for an appointment first. Otherwise, you might get there and find out they're not in or they're too busy, et cetera. But now with um, you know, the next generation, they're, they're kind of expecting that they should be able to go online 24 seven, uh, get quotes about changes they're considering, maybe buying a new car, looking at a new house, um, or actually make changes to existing policies, right? And um, you know, I'm a guilty guy I, 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 in terms of, you know, I find myself frequently, you know, Saturdays at 2 a.m. happens to be a time when I, I be, I'm, I'm online doing banking and stuff like that. So you know what, sometimes I wanna look at my insurance stuff too and consider changes there. So um, I think that's, that's a big uh, part of the, the driver uh, to what's happening out there is just the, 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 the newer generation, the next generation is expecting uh, and demanding that, that they have access 24 seven. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, we go by no like, and trust, right? So 
it's it's important trust being the foundation of that greg as we're in this you know more digital experience and world where you know people are up at 2 a.m making changes to their insurance policies do you have an example or two of some of the newer insure techs coming through either your program of that you've seen to help meet digital customers where they are today yeah yeah definitely definitely and um I don't know many people. I hope I hope there aren't many people up at two a.m. checking their insurance coverages, but I guess there, I guess there could be. Um, it depends on what, what happened at one thirty. Right, right. right. Yeah, it depends <laughs> on what happened. Yeah, it's, that's exactly right. That's, you you got into a car. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. a good one. So um, yeah, so I've got. Um, I can give you a few different examples. And so one of the things that we have over in the lab, um, over at Upward Labs, is we have a lot of companies with IoT solutions, right? Um, and so this sort of millennial solution and people who want these IoT based solutions are, um, you know, the types of sort of digital change that I think are really going to continue to profoundly affect the insurance industry. And I'll give you just two kind of practical examples. So, um, so I have a, a current company in my, um, in my cohort, which has a, um, as a solution, it basically has a smart HVAC filter. Um, and the smart HVAC filter is unbelievable because not only does it have the ability to basically clean out particular counts that would include the coronavirus, um, but it also has an IoT-based solution which will tell you when, the, when your HVAC filter is full. Um, and small little things like that in terms of health, in terms of safety, um, are big things, you know, like, um, I don't know about you, but like every, like, you know, 18 months I wake up and I say, oh shoot, I should have changed my HVAC filter. And I go downstairs and it's all sort of, um, you know, dirty and, and dingy and it needs to be changed. But things like that are, are where everything is basically headed in these connected devices and the devices connected through IoT are getting more and more important. I'll give you one more example, which is that same thing for, I had a company in my last cohort who had a, a smart water submeter. Um, and so the water submeter will basically tell you if a, if a pipe had burst and then have the ability for you to basically shut the submeter off, right? Um, to shut the water off using a press of the button on your mobile phone. You know, those are just sort of like common sense solutions, you know, to um, challenges. And even in the insurance industry who struggles with water as a liability and water um, being one of the leading sources of claims, that those types of solutions are basically where the industry is headed. So. Um, and I would say, you know, sort of more power to all of those different types of solutions as they evolve. Absolutely. And Michelle, you know, you mentioned you wear two hats, just like Stacy, in your, in your professor career, mm -hmm. you work a lot with students and, and getting them ready to, you know, mindset shift in education and then focus on insure tech. What are some of the things that you see in education and whether it's specific to the insure tech space or just how, um, how things need to evolve. So education obviously has gone digital for, for better, worse, or indifferent, but how is this kind of translated into that sector? And what are you doing to help get the next generation, so the millennials or the Gen Z, ready to, to step into this insure tech space? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, I think over the last couple of years, uh, we've made a really concerted effort at the UConn School of Business to try to um, change the way that those entering the workforce think about insurance and the opportunities in, in insurance. So, um, and who is involved in uh, the future workforce uh, within the insurance industry, right? So um, an example is that we've got an incredible data analytics program um, at the UConn School of Business. And uh, a lot of the students there uh, automatically think about, um, you know, careers in big tech, um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera right? They're like, I, in, in order to use this data set, the, this, this skill set, I want to go out and, and work for one of these tech giants. Um, and we've had incredible success by actually bringing in local insurance executives and um, uh, describing the way in which um, the large corporations here are utilizing those same skill sets and opening up opportunities locally uh, to, to be able to, to really make a difference close to home without having to, to move uh, across the country um, or uh, compete with the incredible amount um, of other folks who are dreaming of uh, working at, uh, at those tech giants, right? So um, really trying to, to think critically about um, what's happening 
how the insurance company, uh, insurance industry is changing. I mean, so data analytics is one, IoT, uh, obviously the hardware solution is collecting all of that data. Uh, it's coming in um, careers in cybersecurity uh, that um, are, are gonna focus in on that. So um, it's really been eye-opening, I think, um, for a lot of the students in that insure tech class to be thinking about um, uh, challenges and opportunities that they never thought would touch insurance. Autonomous vehicles, right? Of course there's an insurance play in all of that. Um, uh, what happens when we go from owning our own cars uh, all the time to um, uh, you know, subscribing to uh, car share services of the future where we have things on demand? Um, uh, what happens when we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic and travel freezes? Um, and uh, trip insurance and coverage kind of comes into the kind of comes into play. Um, what do you think about when uh, all of a sudden a virus that we've never heard ab uh, about before um, is up as part of a pre-existing condition to going on and uh, you know uh, further on health coverage? So I think that um, we've seen that things that are happening real life uh, in everybody's. Um, kind of a lived experience, uh, students are starting to understand that there's an insurance angle there and it's a really interesting one and they can be a leader in thinking through uh, how to uh, to apply that to, to insurance and ultimately um, improve lives because um, I never really appreciated the power of insurance before I got involved in all of this uh, about four years ago, right? But insurance is what um, makes the world go around and it's what makes um, taking risk possible. So for entrepreneurs, um, we better appreciate insurance because that's what's got our back at the end of the day when uh, everything goes sideways. So uh, we, we've uh, been in, encouraged by seeing more students kind of go, ah, that's really cool. Never thought I could do it here, um, but I'm about to, uh, to try to make that happen. And Laura and Michelle, I want to just uh, uh, parlay off that. We host the actuarial boot camp each year for high school students. Uh, to get acquainted with the actuarial uh, career pathway. We have the highest concentration of actuaries here in Connecticut per capita. So we decided as an industry to start growing our own and start you know, um, sprinkling the, the actuarial pixie ducks on them at around high school age. But this is the first year that we added two insure techs to come in and speak to the students. So um, knowing that this is going to be something, they are going to have to know how to, to um, manage that risk and rate it as a product potentially, um, look at the loss ratios and determine its, and maybe determine the, the livelihood and its probability of, of, of um, becoming a, a, a strong ROI in the company. So yeah, for the first time we had our high school students uh, to insure techs came in to speak to, to the students to talk about this new not really a trend anymore, uh, but a part of insurance that's going to be mainstay. Absolutely. And you know what they say, if you can get an actuary excited, big things must be happening. <laughs> um, so, to, so to stay on the, on the forward thinking and the forward looking before we go into the positives, that's a question in regards to um, taking the conversation into account. We talked a little bit about the past, the present, and looking ahead to the future. Do you think that there's future risks that people have not considered? And how do you think the, the industry will react to that? Stacy? I see you uh, lean forward. So this one's going to you. All right, so when it comes to predicting the future, I like to rely on my deck of cards. So <laughs> let's just see where to start with this one. So, uh, we got here the ace of hearts. That's actually a good one. So hearts, um, uh, health is an, is uh, is obviously an, an important part of of everybody's life. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have much of a life without it. So um, you know the future of of health insurance is um, constantly changing. First off, there's a lot of you know regulation and stuff uh, about health insurance, uh, either on the cyber side or um, just in terms of, I think everybody cares about it because it's it's darn expensive, and uh, obviously, you know, with an election coming, it's a big topic as well. But um, you know, the the future of health insurance, they're they're constantly looking at um, you know solutions that help either create better, healthier uh, lives or, or have better um, ways of treating people with conditions. Uh, help the um, and, I, and I think the future of health insurance 
is, is going to continue trying to identify those things and where they could be deployed at scale, there are big dollars behind it. Um, and insure, insurance, health insurance is also always looking at the cost side of things um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the network of, uh, of providers that they have uh, that, that provide health care services. And, you know, recently, I think with COVID-19, we've seen a big uh, trend there with, you know, doctors going to online, um, uh, you know, instead of going to the doctor's office, you, you do it online now. And uh, that's been a great cost um, savings for, uh, for the industry, actually, uh, as well as more profitable for, for the doctors, right? So it's been, um, it's been one of these win-win things. But I, so I think the future of, of health insurance really is uh, continuing to look for better outcomes at lower costs. And, and Susan, if you had a magic eight ball, what do, you, what do you foresee as some of the potential risks or the future risks that people should take into account? And Susan is so excited. She's actually muted herself because she can't have her projections shared. <laughs> oh, well, as I was saying, I can't see it because it's so difficult. Uh, the answer is no. So whatever it is, the answer is no. <laughs> and, and I'd like to also uh, showcase that this eight ball is no longer the dark black. It's a beautiful, I don't know, multicolored, psychedelic ball. So I don't know. This is, I guess, the new Generation X um, eight ball. But um, in, in, in all seriousness, uh, you know, I believe, Stacy, yes, healthcare is certainly a sector of insurance that's going to see some drastic changes, but so is life. And uh, so is property casualty. I think the insurers will invest in uh, a skilled workforce that's gonna be able to be nimble and opportunistic and help support where they're going. So I think that's gonna be a huge um, a focus and a priority, a strategic priority. You know, we are all are virtual uh, now. I think that allows insurers to expand the horizon on their workforce. So I believe that that's gonna also become a very competitive edge and one we're going to seek to compete for here in Hartford, Connecticut. But I believe that that is going to be a place where insurers are going to uh, invest dollars as well as in the technology and the digital transformation of whatever their customer expectations are. So those two tracks are my future prediction of the insurance industry where it's going. Michelle, do you have any predictions to share with the group? Um, I think I, I think it's really just about taking a look at where our lifestyle is going, right? Um, how our uh, kind of ownership model of property uh, continues to shift and change um, the way that per we, we think about permanence in our life uh, versus non-permanence, right? Um, uh, and uh, think about uh, alternative models, everything from ownership of cars to property and, and everything else. I mean, I think as as the, the climate continues to change and uh, different places uh, end up being more habitable than others uh, and people may choose to reinvest in rebuilding in places versus not, right? Um, how that's going to uh, kind of play out within uh, the insurance sphere. But um, I see a, a much greater emphasis on um, collecting information to be forward-looking and, and predictive rather than um, relying on historical data. So uh, hopefully we've got some good intelligence to to get us a little bit ahead of the curve on that one. Absolutely. And Greg, do you have any predictions you'd like to share? Yeah, I think that's a good one. Look, um, you know, I, I just to go back to your earlier theme, uh, Laura, in and around risk. I mean, it's, you know, I think right now the biggest risk is the risk of not trying new things, right? Um, I think we are in an environment where, you know, the insurance companies and the startups and everyone knows that you've got to try new things, right? And you you see it, there's sort of this undercurrent, you know, sitting underneath so many of these industries where people are out there thinking up a, a new way to do it, a better way to do it, a better way to distribute it, a cheaper way to distribute it. People are just constantly thinking up these different types of things. And we're at the point now where many of those are starting to take traction and many of those are starting to get, to, to take hold, right? Um, so the biggest one that I see is that if you're, if you're not forward thinking, if you're not innovative, if you're not willing to try new things and you're not willing to embrace the types of things that are coming that as the world continues to evolve, and it might not be 
you know, a year from now, it might not be 18 months from now, but five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there's not the, there's not the, um, you know, it's not an insignificant risk that the companies that don't embrace that are basically just going to be left behind and be left in the dust. And so that, that's basically what I see would be the biggest risk that we have right now. That's great. And in our last three minutes, um, so if I'm in the audience and I'm wondering what else I can do to become involved in the Hartford ecosystem or to stay involved in the Hartford ecosystem, what are some of the things that we have upcoming? Susan, I'll let you start. Um, I know this is a really exciting week for, for content. And I know the summit is coming up on the end of the week. So I'll let you tell the, the viewers a little bit about that. Great. Thank you, Laura, for the opportunity. And, and one, I guess to answer your question first, stay connected. I heard that through the variety of the panelists, stay connected to the events. Um, make sure you have an opportunity if there is one. And we, as Stacy knows, and Michelle and Greg, we host events, Laura, uh, so many uh, here to focus on the ecosystem here in the insurance capital. So I would say that, that please, uh, if you can, the Insurance Capital Summit will be held at uh, Tuesday, I'm sorry, on Thursday and Friday of this week, it's virtual. Each year we put a spotlight on what is the premier thought leadership, the innovators, the, the leadership that is the insurance capital. So we can show the world where the industry is going, what are the important issues, what are the disruptors, how are we managing risk, um, and where are we going? And that way, if you want to know what, are the, what is the leadership thinking on innovation in stressful times, data and digital adoption, um, risk management, uh, that is where uh, you can go, um, insurancecapitalsummit.com. Uh, Please feel free to reach out to me. My email is right there, and I can make sure you get connected to that event. That's great. Greg, do you have anything upcoming to mention that people can stay involved with? Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the, the one for us, Laura, is that we're sort of open and, you know, we're one of the only programs now and, and, and I know, God willing, there's going to be more that have started in in person. Um, so we're over here, you know, uh, Upward Hartford, which is located on the mezzanine level over at 20 Church Street. So if there are, you know, startups that are out there or people that are interested in connecting, just, you know, come on over to um, the 20 Church Street and to Upward Hartford and would love to have a conversation. Um, you know, and then outside of that, we're going to have, um, which is forward thinking down the line, we'll have our demo day for our current cohort. That's not until fe next February, February 10th. Um, but certainly for folks, the last thing I would say is for folks who do want to connect, you know, my email is here on the screen and everyone's email is here on the screen. And for those who want to stay connected, just shoot me a note and, um, you know, would love to, you know, grab a cup of coffee or, you know, learn more about what the audience is up to. Fantastic. And Michelle, anything to mention for people to stay involved and engaged? Yeah. So, um, like Greg said, feel free to shoot me a note. Also, um, jump over to launchinhartford.com, subscribe to our newsletter, um, uh, and we'll be sure to get you uh, involved in all of that. Um, take a look at the amazing content that Laura and her team at uh, Nassau Reimagine uh, are, are putting together on a weekly basis. Um, it's really, really good stuff, uh, pulse of the industry type of thing. Um, and I, I love taking a look at it uh, as well. So, um, and then, you know, visit in, uh, uh, Hartford, um, and sure tech Hartford with Stacy too. He's always got something uh, brewing and uh, one of the best places to kind of just jump in and make um, uh, in-person connections here in the city. Absolutely. And Stacy, anything to highlight? Well, we're um, our next event uh, will be in, in December. And you know, one, of the, one of the challenges of COVID-19 is having to do all these events virtual. Uh, but still, we've been able to pull that off all year, and we're looking at our 2021 plan as well. So if anybody has ideas, maybe you'd like to be a part of the show sometime, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and we can try to find ways to, to plug you in directly. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us today. We're at the top of the hour, and we look forward to more great content during Techstars Startup Week Hartford. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for organizing, Laura. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.